back to the last session of the day. So this is the third talk in the EP and Stats course. So Rachel Cummings from Georgia Tech is going to start out by talking about work on private synthetic data generation. And then midway through, there'll be a switcheroo, and Sesha will come back and talk about other applications. Um, so thanks, Rachel. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am the first half of the last talk of, of the day. Um, and I want to thank um, um, the folks who are like officially supposed to be talking for sharing some of their time today. I'll be about half this session. We'll see. Um, so I am talking about private, about private synthetic data generation. Although maybe this should be more of the title, a computer scientist perspective on statistics, maybe question mark. Um, I was previously in a um, computer science department. I'm now in like an operations research and stats department, and I'm still learning the language of um, statisticians. And so I really do feel like I approach this field from a CS perspective, but still trying to be appreciative of the tools given to us by the rich field of, of stats. Um, I do have a minor speech impairment, so if I pause briefly during the talk, I promise I'm not just daydreaming. <laughs> All right, and so up until now, we have been thinking mostly about forms like this, how we have some, how we have some particular database, so we have some analysts, and she wants to like um, ask a bunch of things about her, her data until she finds some like um, some like um, hypothesis that is a good fit on on the data. Now we're going to switch to thinking about something like this, and so it's the same model, except instead of outputting a like um, hypothesis, she's going to produce a brand new database that will hopefully um, share the same broad statistical properties with the original database. And because we're here, we're going to think about some kind of like privacy-preserving barriers um, that might belong here or it might belong here. Um, I think I don't need to motivate in this room why we care about producing data in a way that is uh, differentially private. So I will assume that we all agree that like that's an important task. Um, so like a few things that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk briefly about like why is this an important problem? Why is it not enough to just output um, hypotheses? Um, and I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about some like uh, current tools that we know how to use. Um, to like uh, privately produce data, and also th things that like we as a community can be thinking about, particularly in the next semester and like um, beyond, as we're all here thinking about about this broad topic. Um, so, why should we care about generating synthetic data? And the main reason is that is that like that's what people use all the time. If you talk to a um, practitioner who's not a privacy expert, they don't want to learn how to use all of your DP mechanisms, and they're used to being handed data and just like doing analysis on data. And so really, we as a privacy field should meet that need and we should give them, them data. Um, some more like nuanced answers is that they may not trust tools that we give them, especially if they, especially if they're not particularly interested in, in like uh, trying to learn about privacy, and they just want to run analyses. Um, and it also allows them to do kind of like all the stuff that they would be doing before. Um, and we don't have to worry about if there exists like a DP mechanism for a particular task. A really nice thing is that it allows them to do anything they want on this data sets, and it will still preserve differential privacy because of post-processing. And so really this is saying I don't have to think about composition guarantees. If I hand someone privatized data, then they can just freely use it. Another nice thing in practice is that we don't have to think about some like interaction, how they first hand a query to some like trusted private analyst and they then like evaluate that, that and give them back some like um, private, private answer. There's a lot of back and forth and it would be great if we didn't have to, to like do that. And then also there's there's some cases where we just have to publish data. For example, the um, Census Bureau legally has to produce microdata um, that looks like a database. OK, so I'll now talk about three um, tools um, that we know. 
Um, but first, some preliminaries and some quotation. I'm going to think about the database as being some, some x that consists of like um, n entries from some data universe n. And so this n is like uh, the space of all possible things that your data might be. If we're talking about like a binary data, then this is just 0, 1. If we're talking about, about your like um, health information, then this is like uh, the space of all possible medical records that you might have. And so depending on different contexts, this n might be very large or very small. We're gonna, going to talk about queries and the um, sensitivity of a qu query, as we saw in the last talk, is just the maximum change in, a, in the value of some function as I move, as I move between neighboring databases that are, that are the same except for one person's data. And finally, I'm going to be talking about um, alpha beta accuracy. And this is an important notion, given that we had a slide um, during the last talk about, about how different fields have different accuracy notions. Um, this is much more of a computer science style accuracy notion. And it says that like with high probability, I want it to be the case that if I evaluated some query on my true data, versus if I evaluated it on the database produced by some, by some um, mechanism M, then the answer is going to be close up to some additive alpha. <coughs> Questions so far on this stuff? Um, yeah. Why doesn't that just directly contradict privacy requirements? Um, if this alpha was going to be zero, then it probably would. Um, I guess if this alpha is um, zero and the beta is, then it would. But this is going to be able to allow us to like uh, parameterize how close am I, given this alpha and beta, how close am I to the true answer with high probability. And so this actually looks kind of like the pack style guarantee that we saw, how I'm saying is going to be approximately correct, probably. I think it also depends on what big F is. Like the richer big F is, the more it's intentional. Privacy guarantee. Yeah. Sorry, is, the, is it that guarantee simultaneously for all f or for every fixed f? Does lack of probability? Um, yes. So the quantifier goes goes up. Well, well. So this must hold simultaneously for all f, but probably one might be there. Yeah. Is this an algorithm? Such that for all. <laughs> is, it, is it a joke or like a real question? <laughs> I genuinely can't tell anymore. <laughs> so it's saying if you hand me some M, then if then I'm going to give you back some alpha beta for that particular oh, M. Right. So, so and so this is a property of a particular algorithm that you hand me. Yeah. Not the yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so now to the actual problem. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, small db, and this is by like uh, Blum, the Git Roth back in um, 2008, and this takes in some some particular database x, and it's going to produce a new database y of size that depends logarithmically on the size of your query class, and it's going to depend for some desired accuracy alpha. It'll depend 1 over alpha squared. Um, and it's going to, and it's going to like achieve this in a very simple way. It's just going to sample some small database y, hence its name. It's going to sample some y in a way that is like exponentially biased towards things um, that match that match f um, for all. Um, for all possible queries in this class. Um, for those of you familiar, this is really just an instantiation of the exponential me mechanism, only we're going to output a like database. Um, and so more formally, here's, here's like the same thing put in like an algorithm form. Um, so it takes in database and a query class, accuracy parameters and privacy parameters. And we're first going to write down every 
every possible database of size log f over like alpha squared. You should be concerned about this, and we'll come back to that next. <laughs> um, and then for each of those, it's going to assign a quality score, which is sort of like, um, how well would I be doing if I published this z as my database? And it's just going to be the like, uh, worst case performance over all f in my query class, and the like, additive difference of that f evaluated on the true database versus on this like, um, small db z. And we're then just going to sample some y with um, probability proportional to um, x of this epsilon times a quality score all over 2 times i delta f. OK, and so it's very simple. Uh, I just write down all possible th databases, and I pick one that is good. Um, you should be concerned about this step because they have to write down all possible databases. And so it takes exponential time. And it's like exponential and a thing that is small. Oh, and this log should be on the top. It's not log of the entire thing, but it's log on the top. Um, um, so, it's, so it's exponential in log. And so this says, as long as you don't have too many queries that you want to evaluate, it's fine. Um, but maybe I should be concerned about this like exponential and the accuracy guarantee alpha squared. And the performance guarantee of this, I'm going to state things, thank you to Gautam, um, for talking about what this C up front means um, for the um, computer scientists. This is just a like big theta, um, but if you don't like that, there's some constant uh, times all of this, this stuff. And so this um, small db is going to be epsilon differentially private, and it's also alpha beta accurate for this alpha. Um, and so it depends log on a lot of things, and that's nice, all over epsilon n uh, to some one third third power. And so this alpha looks like 1 over n uh, to the 1 third. And so going back to this, now I have this like alpha squared. And we're now starting to get n in the exponent. And so if you have a very large database, this is going to take exponential time. So some pros are that we have like very strong formal accuracy guarantees that can tell you they're going to have this accuracy. Um, for all queries in your query class F that you gave to me up front. That's great. Um, cons are that it takes a really long time to, to run, and you only get accuracy for this like, pre-specified query class. I make no guarantees about the performance for the other queries that do not belong to F, and so it can be like, arbitrarily wrong on those. Are there classes of queries for which this is more efficient? Um, so if your, if your query class is small, then it's good. And if your input database is small, th then it's good. And also if you don't care about getting very good accuracy, then it's also good. But no, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so very useful, yeah. But no large uh, query class which has some structure which enables. Uh, uh, oh, right. Large margin classifiers. Uh, uh, Maybe one thing is if like the log f can be replaced by VC dimension of f, and I guess if that's small. Ah, oh, yeah, true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if your query class has some structure, then this log f can be can be can be like replaced by the like VC dimension, and so then this might be a smaller thing. You still have the problem of n, but eh. yeah, it's basically you should not try to use this in practice for any kind of like for any kind of like big data things. Yeah. Um, OK, so it's great in theory, not so useful in practice. One more tool is the private multiplicative weights algorithm. And this comes from Hart and, and um, Hothblum back in 2010. Um, and for this, we're going to have to shift our thinking a little bit about, about what like, a database is. And we shouldn't think about it as being a list of like entries, um, one for each person. But instead, we should think about it as being, as being a like a histogram. And I'm going to count how many people 
have a particular data type. Um, um, and so this like xi is going to be the fraction of the database entries um, that have type i um, for i from 1 to the size may data universe. And so again, if this is like binary data, n equals 2, and this is very small, if this is like a person's medical record, and is extremely large. Um, and again, it, it depends on like how you plan to actually use this. And this algorithm works by just maintaining a like a public histogram y um, that kind of reflects all the current things that we know um, about the input database x. Um, and it's going to be like iteratively updated. And so eventually this y is going to move like uh, closer and closer to x over time. And here's how it works. When a new query f arrives, I'm going to check if this query evaluated on the true database versus, versus on the um, public histogram y is close up to some additive alpha guarantee. And if it is close, then I can say, this is in fact easy because the like public thing that the world can see is giving me a like a uh, correct answer. And so I'm just going to say go check why because that's like um public information and it won't cost me in my privacy budget. If it's not, if they have very different answers, I'm going to say f is hard and I'm going to and I'm going to like output f of x on the true database plus some um, noise. And I'm then going to update my like uh, belief about why. Um, I'm slightly lying here because I can't exactly do this, um, but instead I have to like uh, check if things are like easy versus hard in a private way, and I'm kind of like uh, sweeping that onto the, the rug, um, but it effectively works like this. Um, and once I have no more hard qu queries in my class, then it must be the case um, that for all queries that I care about answering, I have an approximately correct answer up to this alpha term. Um, instead of telling you in math how this update works, I'm going to show you a picture because I think those are always nice. Um, so I start out with some like a public database y. And imagine um, that on my first query, I was like overpredicted, and my answer was like I'm too large. Well, this means that I'm putting like uh, too much weight on some things and like not enough weight on some other things. And so this means I should like uh, push down the push down the weight I have on the types of data that will make the answer to that query large. And I should increase the weight on things that will, that will make the that will make the answer to that query small. And so I go from this to this. On the opposite hand, if I under predicted, if my answer on y was um, too small, then I should do just the opposite. I should now like um, increase the weight on things that will make f have a larger value on y, and I should like uh, decrease the weight on things that will, that will make f have a smaller value on, on y, and so I will end up with something like this. And so this is the update rule that will be performed here every step. And so as soon as I find a query that I'm doing poorly on, and then going to update and incorporate the fact that I have, that I have been doing poorly on this, um, and I'm going to update according to this like uh, noisy answer. And so really, because we can stop as soon as we've seen, as soon as we have no more hard queries, and the goal is really to show that I like, uh, don't have that I don't have like a, too many hard, hard things, and I can eventually just um, stop updating, and I will have reached this stage where my y is approximately correct. Oh, there's supposed to be animations, but alas, OK. <laughs> All right, so here's the entire slide. OK, and so this like um, accuracy guarantee, um, so we have at this is like epsilon differentially private, and it's alpha beta accurate for this alpha. 
Um, the main thing to note is that it like looks pretty similar to the one that we had before. I still have this one third power. I still have things on my log, and I still have like an epsilon n on the bottom. And so this is good. And the proof of this accuracy guarantee relies on a um, on a um, potential argument showing that as we update, as we have more hard queries, then my y is going to converge to my x, approximately. Um, and I won't have too many hard qu queries in the process. And you might think, is it bad that we're converging to the true database? That seems to be like I'm inconsistent with the goal of privacy. And this really is due to, to the fact that we're thinking about things in like a um, histogram form. And so I'm not thinking about like a list of people's data, um, but rather I'm thinking about a count, like um, how many people have each type. And so for example, if I say, say that like in my true database, I have like, um, it's like 60% um, male, 40% female, it means I'm going to like uh, converge to that, but maybe I'm gonna end up with like, you know, 58 and 42. Math, yes, good, okay. Um, um, but that fact will not really help me to just like reconstruct individual en entries in my database. And so it's like okay to like uh, converge to things approximately in the histogram sense where it's not really okay to like um, converge in the list sense. Um, this is very hand, hand wavy. You know that you're upset. A little by this, but I'm, uh, I'm sweeping, I'm sweeping a lot of things under the rug. I, I feel like part of it is also that you just, if there are no more hard queries, you just wouldn't, like you may not convert, like your public histogram may not convert to the actual histogram if you're not asking all the hard queries essentially. Yes, yeah, and so in fact it's important that it won't converge exactly to X, but it will converge to like to a thing that is close to, to x, but because you stop as, once you have like um, alpha accuracy, you're not going to keep pushing and try to achieve alpha over two. And so you're guaranteed to be, to be in some small radius around x, but you're not guaranteed um, to achieve exactly x. And so that's kind of like a critical point. But it's also like close to x as measured by like the queries algorithm. those queries. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's somehow important because if we're close to x and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, I miss a, when is it a hot query? If your public histogram is not correct on that, on that query. And so I'm going to maintain this thing publicly, and that's viewable by the entire world. And I'm going to like, um, to like um, check, is my F approximately correct on Y? If yes, then it's easy because I'm already doing well. And if no, then it's hard because I'm doing poorly on it. And so therefore, I have to like um, update according to that query. So these are not absolute things. They're like that, harder easy with respect to Y. With, yeah. That's, yeah. So another and way, the current Y as well. Like Sasha mentioned this idea of like a verification server. So you can mm -hmm. actually imagine like you were keeping Y, and now you're seeing what Y would give you and asking the verification server, am I correct? And occasionally it will tell you no, and you will reincorporate that information into Y. And the surprising thing is that after a bunch of like, no, you're not correct, you'll be correct like in perpetuity. Yeah, 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 yeah. not so surprising, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so pros of this approach are that we have, again, formal accuracy guarantees. I can tell you precisely what alpha you have, and, and that's great. And it runs in time. Linear in the size of the data universe um, times the count of the hard queries, and we bound these insane factors not to to um to um to um many of them, and so that that's great. The con is that well, this n might be really large. Again, if I'm thinking about about some like a uh, very large document, well, I can have a whole bunch of those, and so this may still be unreasonable um, for some applications. And again, we still only have accuracy for the pre-specified queries. 
And we have here a little bit more, we have here a little bit more flexibility compared to the small DB approach, um, where there you have to specify queries up front all at once. Here, here I can choose them adaptively as, as I go, but again, I get like, um, I get like no accuracy guarantees um, for the queries that I haven't specified. All right, and the final approach is uh, private GANs, um, which is a completely different approach. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, generative, generative adversarial networks, or, or GANs, are really just like uh, two competing neural nets playing in a zero-sum game. Um, and there's one who is a um, generator, and their job is to like uh, produce synthetic data. And the other one is the um, discriminator who is given some data and then has to uh, decide if it's the true data or if it was created by the um, generator. And these like um, and these um, neural nets are both going to like um, iteratively update their update their like edge weights using um, stochastic gradient gradient descent. And so the picture looks kind of like this. I know it's small on the screen. Um, so there's some like uh, oh, there's some kind of like uh, some kind of like input space into G. And that's going to like uh, create data and send them to D. And I'm also going to have like some real data, and that's going to go into D as well. And D has to guess if the data that it sees comes from the true data or from G. And then D's answer goes back and helps like uh, both of these things update update their like edge weights. Um, and again, these things. Um, tend to converge well in practice. How to privatize these? Um, so it's actually quite simple. We really just have to like add noise in the gradient update step on both of these networks. Um, we actually only have to add noise to, to um, D because it turns out D is the only one who can see the raw data from this step. And then, like everything after that is just uh, post processing, and so that preserves, and so that preserves privacy. And so it's okay if we train G regularly, and D we have to train pri privately. And it's possible to undo that by just adding noise into the gradient in the update step. Um, there's some tricks happening there, like you have to like um, clip things to make sure to make sure that there's bounded sensitivity of the um, gradient. Um, and of course, there's a lot of like uh, tricky things happening here that I'm not quite saying, um, but, it, but it like essentially boils down at a high level to just this core idea. And I want to also point out a few things um, done by folks in this room. Um, so this first paper, we have Quinal and we have Ilya, maybe is he here? No, okay, just you. Um, and so this paper was on like a differentially private deep learning. Um, and so since scans are a special case of deep learning, a lot of the approaches there apply in GANs as well. Um, and we have this paper, the first W is from Stephen Wu. Um, and, and in the back, they applied like a private GANs to like um, generate medical data. Um, um, and that worked well. And Marcel, I, I saw you. Um, his his um, paper here incorporates like a Bayesian framework. Um, and the real punchline here is that like um, these things like tend to work well in practice. Um, and so this paper or and this graph is taken from this paper. Thank you, Stephen. Um, um, <laughs> And it's showing like uh, two different things that we're trying to learn. Um, so there's this one and this one. And the red is a true data. The blue is a non-privately trained GAN. And the purple is a privately trained GAN. And the thing to note is that purple performs about the same as the red and the blue. 
Um, and if you want to hear more about these things, then check out this paper or ask Stephen. He'll be around all term. And so pros here are, 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 are that like it works very well in practice. Like these things work. It's great. Um, the queries don't have to be specified up front. You can just kind of like uh, train, train your GANs and it will spit out parameters and you don't have to say, I want to answer these queries but not these ones. And once it's trained, then you can just share the edge weights. Um, and those edge weights, and those edge weights um, can be used to then just like um, generate arbitrary amounts of um, data. So it's great. Some cons are pretty major. Um, the biggest one is that there's no formal accuracy guarantees. And so in fact, the reason why you don't have to specify things up front is because we can't formally tell you they're going to have accuracy on some queries. <laughs> um, so that's a thing that we should be concerned about. Um, they're also very slow to train. They're fast to use once they have been trained, but the training is very computationally expensive. Um, and also in general, like a deep learning is kind of a black box. And so then it brings up all these other questions about like um, fairness and transparency um, that we should be concerned every time we don't quite understand exactly what's going on inside of an algorithm. Adam? Would, would it be possible to build in specific accuracy constraints by kind of rather than training sort of an arbitrary distinguisher on the, as the, the adversarial network to you know, ask it to look for, you know, at pairwise marginals or whatever it is, the feature that you think is, like, some set of important features. Kunal is nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. I'm not really an expert on this, but you're, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, really, what's happening is we're using, is we're using, like, an algorithm that is guaranteed to perform well on a convex problem, on a non-convex problem, and we see that like we tend to reach something that looks like an optima, but like we don't know. Um, I think what you're proposing is maybe broader than just private GANs, but as a question of sort of like um, how to get accuracy for deep learning in general. And that sounds important, but that's outside of my expertise. I guess you can view private multiplicative weights as a generator discriminator game as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I mean, that comes up pretty much yeah. explicitly in like the dual query right. algorithm. Yeah. So I, I guess what I was wondering is like, is there a way to get sort of the best of both worlds where you're you're sort of pointing your distinguishers <laughs> and at the very least, these, you know, here's a class of distinguishing rules that you should consider and sure. anything else you can figure out too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that seems like something that should be very easy to do in practice. That, that, uh, don't know if anyone has tried it. Right. Yeah. That, that was my question. That, yeah. That seems like a good idea, and I hope someone tries it. <laughs> yeah? Is it at all uh, even possible to uh, have some sort of like conditional accuracy guarantees basically based on like uh, the non-private, suppose like we believe that this model non-privately has certain baseline accuracy, can we at least have some formal accuracy guarantees that only account for the noise or the error due to privacy? With respect to the like to the best non-private uh, model, I would say very probably. Um, I don't know if that exists, but that but that seems but that seems like a thing that is very doable um, because we know precisely how much noise we we add because you can specify a clipping parameter and that tells you how much noise you add and we know how things like um, Gaussians concentrate and so that seems like a thing that should be doable. I don't don't know if it has been done or not. I Again, I'll defer to him. Um, no. Fully clear what should be the non-private accuracy guarantee to start with. Like, you know, what does it mean? Like, it might it classification error or whatever. Like, some some so baseline. I don't need to know what. Model, right? Sorry. This is training a generated model, right? So uh, right. So sure. Yeah. Uh, whatever like certain accuracy guarantees that people empirically uh, work with. In the in yeah. these kind of models, I, in my impression, often, often they're kind of ad hoc. You know, most gameplay, I think, look at images. Uh, yeah. There's a transfer learning time techniques. I so see. that's a good question to to think about more principle Yeah, and there is kind of like 
weird feedback <coughs> happening here, and so things really are adaptive. Fortunately, we know that like on differential privacy behaves well under like adaptivity, and so again, this this seems like a thing that should be doable, but I don't know if it's been done. Any questions? Okay. So we have three tools. The first two are great in theory, but not really efficient in practice for the kind of problems that we probably want to use them for. And then we have GANs that are great in practice, but there is no theory um, about their performance. Um, so the first very natural thing that, that we might want is we might want some tools to like um, generate private synthetic data um, that are both efficient for use in practice and still have some like formal accuracy guarantees. I think that's like a very natural question of sort of like what happens in the middle. Um, and maybe the like uh, dual queer paper that I didn't talk about, I'm sorry Marco, um, um, is kind of like I'm starting to get in that point. And also Steven too, sorry. <laughs> um, and beyond that, we might also want these tools um, to not require the kind of analyses we want to do um, to be specified in advance. I want to just like um, hand a person data and say, and say like it's correct, go nuts. And, and I also want this to match analysis needs of what practitioners are, are doing. I'm not really a practitioner, so I don't actually know exactly what these things are. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity for the theorists in the room to, to like, uh, talk to folks in practice and see what do you want to do and what do you wish that you could do on your private data sets. And I think more broadly, and this was mentioned um, two talks ago in sessions, I think, um, is that is that we also have to educate practitioners about what it means that we're handing them private synthetic data. Um, it means that we have like added noise, and so this thing is not the exact ground truth. Um, you may want to do some like uh, pre-processing of the data that I hand you, or change the way in which you do analysis. So we have to like uh, convince them of that. Um, it also means that there's not not really like a one-to-one -one mapping between. Between, between the like entries and the like original data, and then this new data that I give you, um, and importantly, the fact that it may be accurate only on some queries. Um, I imagine practitioners would not like it if I tell them, "Here's a database and the ten things that you're allowed to ask about it." Um, that seems not very useful. Um, so a combination of this and this um, seemed like a really important need um, before these things can be practically used. Maybe we could like switch laptops or... Yeah, oh, maybe sure. while, while the yeah. switch is going on. Yeah. Rachel, yeah. You, actually, uh, I don't know if, if it fits, but can you say a little bit about the ongoing NIST um, um. Yeah. Competition and or sequence of competitions or Yeah, so that is um, so that is this um, that I'm that I'm doing with the group of some un undergraduate and graduate students. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so there is an ongoing NIST competition. Um, um, and they really want to be able to like uh, create private data. Um, to solve exactly this problem. Um, it is proceeding in three periods. Um, the first one was theory, and, and we're currently in like um, period two, where they want code. It's unclear what period three is going to be, but they have allowed a date for that, so cool. Um, and, um, and they are and they are like asking people um, to provide tools for private synthetic data generation. Um, they're giving actually like a pretty absurd amount of prize money. Um, so people should participate if you're interested in, in this. Um, um, and basically NIST has like recognized this is a real need um, and they're trying to do this as a way um, um, to really find out what are best practices 
for this problem, what tools exist, what works and what doesn't. Um, and so they are just very interested in hearing from people like us, and so I think more of us should compete in this. Um, they're currently in the middle of a match. There's two weeks left. Um, and then a third one is going to start in a few more weeks. Um, and I'm happy to send anyone a link about that if you want to hear more. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, <laughs> Um, okay. Ready, ready. Welcome back, Sasha. Sure. Um, okay, so um, here's the nice challenge. Um, I think uh, other thing that perhaps it's interesting, and I'm sorry I may have missed this um, if, if Rachel said it or not. Um, the challenge, uh, I think the current challenge that's going on, or do I think the current one is actually on, on synthesizing American community survey data. And this is a census product that um, we use to update all kinds of estimates about the population between the major censuses that we take. And this is a key product for the census. Um, so I, I think um, maybe that, that's of interest. But um, yeah, just Google NIST DP Synthetic Challenge, and, and you'll get the information and, and the site. Okay. So um, I don't have 95 slides, I promise, <laughs> whatever I'm looking at. Um, I need to get back here. All right. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to basically wrap up our uh, three-hour session um, and point to a couple of additional, uh, perhaps interesting applications that um, people here may be interested in, in looking at, and all in light of answering kind of this question, like how can we really enable private statistical data analysis? Um, and there are a lot of problems that uh, we can um, address there. So I also want to just take a, a minute to say that, um, you know, uh, statisticians have been working on this problem or, or, or sharing um, uh, confidential data um, since the 1960s. Um, and um, I think, you know, there were some valid and good ideas in there, and people are still working on this. It's a very active research area. Um, and we're very well trained, and especially, you know, I would say the survey methodologist in, in on how do we collect the data. And I feel that um, there's much more that we can do privately, um, act actually, with, at, at this also data collection stage rather than constantly just waiting for all the data to be collected and then to manipulate it and edit it and see how we're going to share it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different type of data. So I'll mention a couple of um, examples regarding the census data and synthetic data in particular. I say something briefly on social networks and public uh, medical health data, just as a couple of additional examples of, of things they were interested um, in, in working on. Um, so as far as statistical disclosure limitations, so I said it goes back into the six, back uh, in 1960s, and the idea there always has been that we're again just differential privacy. We're adding bias variance. Uh, we're doing data masking, and and you're either transforming or perturbing records, um, attributes. You're adding some noise. Um, so there are a lot of similarities is there in in in, um, in both the, the what we describe with current mechanisms and what I, I guess some of the uh, statistical disclosure mechanisms from the past are, except they are lacking some more formal. Um, um, evaluations of both the utility um, and, and, and the risk, um, and especially how we understand the, the, the risk. So more modern approaches, um, I mentioned this remote access servers earlier. Um, synthetic data is definitely something that uh, uh, statistical disclosure community is very much interested in, um, and a lot of people are working on that. Um, and of course, there are problems with distributed databases and secure computations, so actually using the cryptographic tools to do uh, analysis on distributed databases. Um, and in, you will probably be surprised even how um, the, the, the settings, how simple they, they seem to be in, in terms of what, it, what type of analysis they want to do in these distributed settings, but yet we don't really have a good solution yet. Or maybe you guys do, but I'm not aware of. Um, 
So synthetic data, so we heard about synthetic data, so I don't really need to go um, into details on this. Um, again, this is a technique that it was actually initially proposed by Rubin um, in early 90s, and, and Steve Feinberg had some ideas also about this in early 90s. So we've been talk, talking and working and developing statistical methodology and synthetic data for a long time. Not clearly with uh, differential privacy guarantees, so th this is what I want to point out here. So the question came up, um, even with respect to um, GANs, but in general, so once you, cr once you create synthetic data, how do you evaluate uh, the utility, how do you evaluate the risk, and ha it has, it it's been, it was believed until recently, I'd say, that any synthetic data release, especially if it's what we call fully synthetic data, is completely safe. Okay? Uh, there are studies showing that that's not uh, necessarily the case, and so now the, the methodology in statistical disclosure um, um, uh, limitation community, I mean, people in this uh, disclosure limitation community are trying to understand what to, how to deal with that. And the fact that you actually, even from the, some synthetic data, um, depending how it's produced, you can have potential identity, actually, uh, disclosure. Okay? The question of, is it valid for inferences? Um, so how do we evaluate that? Um, I will go through a very simple uh, 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 virtual RDC example with synthetic data um, that exists, but basically it's um, based on the data product, the type of analysis people want to do. So there are these so-called uh, specific ut utility measures. Um, so if I want to fit a regression model, I'm going to fit a regression model on a synthetic data set, and then I'm, somebody will have to check for me uh, if those estimates or the confidence intervals uh, correspond to, uh, to, to what I would have gotten if I actually did analysis on the original data. One other thing that I want to mention is that uh, uh, in statistics, the methodology typically requires that you produce multiple synthetic data sets from the same data source. There is some new results uh, on this also uh, in statistics saying when it's enough to have a single uh, data source. But here, I didn't hear anything about multiple replicates uh, uh, necessarily. Okay. Um, so let me quickly mention something about the US Census synthetic data. So there are two synthetic data products that people use that are publicly available. Um, the Survey of Income and Program Participation Longitudinal Business uh, Database. Um, you all are familiar with On the Map. As far as I know, right now, that's currently the only differentially private census product uh, uh, that is available out there. And you can learn more about these databases and their features. Um, I think what's interesting here, if you just look at longitudinal business data, survey income and program, you know that you have a lot of um, uh, um, skewness in, in these data sets, right? They're not necessarily uh, a trivial, okay? Um, so how does one currently interact with these synthetic data sets? So there is a simulated census RDC at Cornell. That's virtual RDC. <coughs> what does it mean? It basically simulates the census research data center. Uh, I am guessing most of you are familiar with the research data centers, or do I need to explain? It's better you explain. I better explain, OK. So um, a research data center, it's a, a data, data enclave. You have to, this is, uh, there are a, a number of them uh, across the country. Uh, these are the centers that, uh, if you want to get access to the original or raw data from the census, you need to put in a proposal ahead of time saying what type of data you're trying to access, what type of survey or some um, uh, uh, actual um, original census data, what type of analysis you're interested in doing. You have to wait a certain amount of time, let's say six months plus. Um, in, in, in good situations um, to get access uh, uh, to actually, for somebody to approve uh, the type of uh, access that, to the type of data that you're interested in. And then you go physically into the RDC, into, into a closed room behind the closed door because you have received the permission to do so. You do all the analysis at the computer in this research data center. You cannot take anything, anything out, right? And then once you're, all of your analyses are done, before you can publish any of your results, somebody, uh, uh, there's a typical disclosure group um, that will have to go through and evaluate for potential disclosures that uh, uh, um, the data you're trying to publish uh, uh, could lead to. 
and then the, then you could publish your results. Okay. So what this um, research data, similar to the research data center, the virtual research data center tries to do is completely mimics the actual computing environment that the census, census provides. So you will have access to the SAS and R, whatever else is available. Um, so you can design your code, your analysis that you want to run ahead of time, and you don't have to sit physically in this research data center, and you don't have to go through this long process of, of being approved. And you can play with these synthetic data sets that they have. And so perhaps while you're waiting to get access to the original data. In some cases, if you some very, very simple analysis you want to do, getting the results on the synthetic data might be sufficient. But in many cases, people are doing quite sophisticated analysis, have sophisticated questions, so they actually have to get access to the original data. So this helps with this waiting period and preparation, um, and so it does help with the uh, uh, data sharing. Um, what I said earlier, typically you have multiple implicates of, of a, a single data set. So this is longitudinal um, uh, uh, database, business database. So this is the original data, just showing some um, uh, uh, trends over the years and, and the means. So that's the blue. And then I'm showing here the two implicates, so two synthetic data sets, and the uh, mean of that and how they compare to, to the data. What's, what's interesting, what I would love to have here are some kind of confidence bounds, but I don't. <laughs> but you can see they don't exactly match, right? Um, so you know there will be some uh, uh, potential error uh, if, even if you're doing synthetic data. But nobody really, uh-huh. Can we just pause there for a second? Yeah, I was trying to get done in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, I understand. Uh, so um, so yeah. the implicates are both consistently tracking each other? So, just so I understand what you're plotting. So the blue is the true? True data. Data and the, the pink and the yellow. Are, are two synthetic data sets. And where's the fourth line, the, the mean of the? Uh, uh, it's, it's the mean of the two. But where is it on the plot? Oh, it's just like. It's like, so you can see it, yes. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's so good. <laughs> my understanding of the purpose of asking for implicates yeah. is to give people a sense of, uns of error. Right. Is for having yes, for having more than the reason why we typically have more than one implicate is to for you to be able to uh, address some 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 error because by the way you create synthetic data, it's a simulation process, right? So you want to be able to account for that as well. Here, the variation between the implicates is tiny compared tiny. to the actual error. Yes. The, the generation, like, so doesn't that kind of like make sort of make fun of the idea of having multiple implicates? <laughs> Not, I mean, to put it a little so. So, okay, I, I was going to get to this. So one of the points that I'm making is that people have been, uh, for a long time, the, 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 the initial proposal from the 90s was that we absolutely have to have the multiple implicates. We need this for, for the right inference, for actually to, be evalu to evaluate the standard errors appropriately. But there is new work showing when you may or may not need more than one implicate. And it has to do, in, in part, what is it that you're trying to generate? I think what Adam's saying is like suppose you generated more implicates. Yes. You would not like you would never get this blue line. Like you would never figure out yes. that the sure. implicates are all below the line. Like it's yes. it's like a bias versus variance. Like thing. in yes. this specific example, yes. the implicates, the multiple implicates seem yeah. totally useless. For, for this purpose. I mean for for this specific estimation task. Um well, what I am saying is they may or may not be use useless because I don't have the standard errors in them. All right, we can come back to it. Sorry. I, I mean, I know what you're saying. You're saying, and, and I mean, this is the scale here as well. But I don't actually know what the standard error on this is. For all I know, it's covering the, the, the implicates. Okay. But the other hand, it's so consistently above all the time, and they're so Our, consistently yeah. on top of each other. Anyway, it's <laughs> fine. We can come back to it. Yeah. We'll come back to the, to, to, to the nitty gritty details. But I, um, and, and I think another point is that there are many different criteria to use to create an implicate. And um, I actually don't know what the specific criteria here was to create an implicate. And it, it's, there are certain decisions in saying, I'm OK to be this much off from the original data, especially if the intent is not to give you the really the correct inference all the time, but for you to, that is, I never said it's correct inference. I said for most cases, people are using to test their codes. 
Okay? In some very simple examples, this, the actual synthetic data may be sufficient for their inferential task. Depending, because the, 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 the statistical integrity in the data that it's preserved highly depends on the statistical model you use to generate this data. Right? And, and so, depending, you know, if I've used, uh, uh, if I preserve the two-way margins, or if I didn't preserve the two-way margins, my, my inference will be affected, right? Uh, if I'm using the inference using, using those uh, margins, okay? So, um, okay, so, so typically, you typically work with multiple synthetic uh, uh, versions of the original data. You are de doing some kind of averaging, okay, to, to estimate the coefficients, to es estimate the standard errors. And then for some kind of an analytic validity check, somebody's going to check on the internal uh, uh, data uh, how well do, do these match, okay? Um, and there's a very general statement that says data analytically valid if coefficients are unbiased and the inference is the same. So in this particular setting, this is what their measure is. They want coefficients of a regression model to be unbiased. Okay, and inference being the same, they're expecting that there's some significant overlap of the confidence intervals okay, for, that you get from the synthetic data and the original data. Is this okay? a rule of thumb or a theorem? This is, this is a, a rule of thumb. They, there are no theoretical results showing why exactly we, we do this. Um, this is more from, from practice purposes, in, and, and it, it can be argued these days, a lot of people say, well, biasness is less of a problem, but I think it also depends on the problem you're trying to solve. I'm sure that uh, Frauke will talk about tomorrow where actually you really want to be unbiased. Okay? <laughs> Um, and so in some direction, so, so, in, so some new directions, so people are considering this when trying to actually prove, when do we need a single implicate versus multiple implicates? Uh, do we have some more valid utility measures? And so I, we actually um, have a, 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 what we call a general utility measure. So what I'm talking about looking at, at the regression coefficients and overlap of the confidence intervals, people consider this specific uh, utility measure, okay? General utility measure wants to compare the original data with the synthetic data. So I am trying to figure out, do the, can I claim that the original data and the synthetic data come from the same generative distribution? Okay. And we actually have a measure called a, a PMSC. P stands for propensity, propensity scores. And uh, if the, P, this measure PMSC, uh, we have some theoretical results on this and it's bounded between 0 and 0.25. And I won't go into details of this. Maybe I can give an informal talk like, you know, when I get back if people are interested in this. But what's nice is that we actually use this measure, again, which is a measure of similarity between these two data sets. If I've done a good job with my synthesis, I really shouldn't be able to distinguish if a record came from original data set or from a synthetic data set. Right? And this is what this propensity score measure does. Okay? Uh, again, saying that, that, that I believe they come from the same underlying uh, distribution. Um, so we use this PMSC measure um, as a um, um, utility in exponential mechanism and then produce synthetic data. And it's nice because it's bounded. <laughs> it's a very, uh, it's a good bound, um, and we're getting pretty good results uh, um, with the data. And I don't expect anyone to tell me ahead of time what type of analysis they're going to do. Because it's similar to GANs in a way that it's just looking at, at capturing some uh, uh, distributional properties, right? I'm not relying necessarily on sufficient statistics on, on, or on some other parameters. Okay? But this is you know, brand new work. We're still working on this. But I think this is a nice direction. It's somewhere, I think, between uh, it addresses perhaps some of the problems that are just issues that were brought up and, and something that we are interested in exploring further. And besides, this measure is something that a lot of statisticians use now. And th this for, for a, this, we didn't propose this for differential, to de develop differentially private uh, synthetic data. We proposed this to actually be able to evaluate synthetic data, a uh, quality of the synthetic data in general. Um, but it turns out that they had these nice uh, properties. And there's also a SynPOP R package that a lot of people are now using uh, for, for creating uh, synthetic data, and it's constantly in the development. Okay. 
So I, am, um, I don't want to spend time on this. Uh, I'm click, qu quickly going to say that some other interesting problems are networks and relation, relational data. Some of you have worked on this. Um, some of the stuff that I talked about today, using measurement um, error uh, concepts and the likelihood concept to get the right inference, uh, you can do it uh, uh, for um, network data. Um, the medical public health data are also very much of interest. So um, there is not much work on um, functional data and functional data analysis. Um, I want to say that Matthew Reimer is here. He's actually an expert on functional data analysis. And these are the type of problems you're looking at. So you have really high dimensional data from one perspective. But you know, I have a sample only, if I think about actual little n, right, of only 200 individuals. And there are all kinds of complexities with these data uh, and problems. And we have begun to look um, at this from a differentially private perspective. And uh, Matt, you can tell you, uh, tell you much more about this. Um, and then one last thing. Um, uh, so doing computations on data that are distributed in, in different databases, uh, we're actually talking to, this is a real problem. We're talking to epidemiologists at Harvard who say, I only have two <laughs> sources of data. There is the insurance claims and the electronic health, health uh, records. And I want to do a secure analysis on these. And I want to get absolutely exactly same point estimates, standard errors, exact same R output or SAS output as if you would have, if you would have gotten, if you, actually be, if you were able to combine the data. Um, and so the struggle here is, is that, you know, again, this part of education, me telling, well, you know, that's great, but then if you're going to publish those original ones, you're back at square one, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting problems still in medical and biomedical setting, and, and particularly in, in, in distributed setting. I know a lot of you are working on what I consider extreme distributed setting with I individual um, devices, but this type of problems are still, still very much what people are interested in. Okay. Um, so, and if you're interested in hearing, um, what statisticians have been doing and are still doing in trying to understand the disclosure um, uh, risk assessment uh, with survey data, longitudinal data. There's actually a webinar um, on February 6, um, well, 12 to 1.30 uh, Eastern time, and uh, you only, it's free. You, you, you can sign up um, by February 5th. Um, and I, I mean, I recommend it if you're really trying to understand what practitioners are interested in and what they're doing. Okay, and, and because both um, Tom Krensky and Jen Chu Li, uh, they have a lot of experience uh, with, with survey data. This is what they've been doing for the past you know, 20, 30 years. Okay? Um, and I'll leave you back with the NIST challenge. Okay? I hope this gives a lot of intro to Frauke for tomorrow morning. <laughs> Questions? Just at the end of it. Right. Are there are further questions? Well, sorry. So, a question I could put for you and Rachel. So, yeah. uh, when you're generating synthetic data, uh -huh. such as, say, a American community survey, yeah. uh, you would expect that the data, that the actual population does not change from, say, five years ago to today. So, you have a very strong prior on what the data should, like, should look like. Uh, and one can imagine kind of using that definitely in the private multiplicative weights okay. version. Uh, have you thought about kind of? Do the other frameworks kind of support a setup where I have a strong prior on the data and I can use that to get much higher quality synthetic data? So without DP, um, people have definitely used the Bayesian framework for creating synthetic data, right? Um, but that said, priors were typically mostly non-informative or they were uh, chosen for the computational purposes rather than using informative knowledge about the, 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 the population beforehand, to, to the extent that I am aware of. But that, you, you raise a good question. And this is some of the things like in the network stuff with relation, relation, relational data. Um, you know, how do you weigh or reweigh, or can we, you know, that, that's, that's, I think it's a very interesting problem, right? Considering, um, and would multiple weights, I guess, would be a way. But. Uh, I guess kind of sort of a bigger picture question about the synthetic data approach. So we saw in sort of the first two talks there was a lot of emphasis on these settings where 
kind of the additional error for privacy is sort of of a lower order <laughs> sampling error. Yeah. And, you know, but we've known since like Kobe's work in the early 2000s that if you have sort of a large enough set of statistics you want to preserve, then the error kind of has to be on the same or even higher order than the sampling error. Mm -hmm. And so in some sense, like just by starting with synthetic data, you maybe can't hope to get, you know, say confidence intervals for normal data that are nearly as tight as what like you talked about. Yeah. And I'm just curious like how this fits into sort of in the bigger picture, like which I mean, so, you just have to have synthetic data, or is it? Almost, I would think almost it's like a non-starter because you can't get anything close to what you could get for like specific tests you want to run or estimators. Okay, so so I first first I think that even with the current current synthetic data methodology, I don't think that we necessarily did a very good job in uh, taking the the synthesis process into consideration. Um, so the general uh, um, framework that I was describing that Vishesh and I are trying to propose, that applies regardless if you're talking about differential, uh, differentially private mechanisms or any, any other mechanisms. So we've been advocating that really even in synthetic data we have to do something like that. Okay? So will that give me better if I account for that error better, so basically explicitly knowing what the mechanism is? We do some of that, but we don't do it as well. Will it give me better results? I don't know. Uh, your second point was or, um, having um, the error. So maybe I no, do, I, do we really need synthetic data? What was that? What? Sorry. So, so maybe like, Remind me. Maybe this goes to the beginning. So like we're, you're saying when we look at like say confidence intervals for yes. like one Gaussian. Yes. You're saying you know with data sets of size like a thousand, the confidence uh -huh. interval even with like all the you know cleverness that went into designing this one algorithm for this one statistic yeah. the confidence intervals are like twice as wide and that's you know not great and now you know you're talking about solving sort of a much harder sure. problem where we can't even get like within a factor of 2 you're getting you know asymptotically slower convergence and i'm just curious like i'm sort of hearing two different things like one thing is even for like this one individual question we currently don't know how to solve it Yep. accurately enough. Yep. And then I'm also hearing like we need to generate data that I can use to answer thousands of questions and I yep. I can't reconcile these things. Like uh, uh, so um, I I don't think I can reconcile it either, but that is the reality of it. And so the reality is that users want access to raw data. Okay? And um, there has to be a trade-off between uh, uh, privacy and, and, and utility, and we have to decide what that is. Yes, Adam. Apologies to Helen. Maybe along similar lines. Would yes. It be possible, maybe this gets at. The, I'm curious what the criteria are for the NIST competition. Would it be possible for I don't know some set of applications to write down an explicit set of criteria for accuracy for? Yes. These. Yes, here, here's Steve. This year, the first stage is actually a very specific problem. Uh, they don't want the general synthetic generation, but rather they want to check the three way marginal distribution of the data. You can randomly select three attributes and look at the three way marginal. And then you actually check the clustering or correlation coefficient of, of those uh, of your synthetic data and compare with the real, real data. So that's one concrete uh, thing they actually use for this. Yeah, so, uh, and they care about three specific tasks for this. They care about uh, clustering, re regression, and um, classification. And they specifically choose data sets where these tasks make sense on them. Um, and it's also like very easy to write down what it means to be accurate for these three three tasks. I think you're asking something more general. I, 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 no, that's a useful answer. That's what the NIST challenge yes. is about. But I guess my question is about the statistics community yes. at large working on this. I yes. mean, synthetic data has been a thing for since yes. the 80s. Yes. Uh, how, how much resistance would there be to like efforts to try and pin down explicit accuracy criteria for synthetic data. Like, somehow, you know, when I read papers on synthetic yeah. 
data, either they're fitting some parametric model. Correct. In which case, okay, right away you're just giving up on everything except whatever's captured by those parameters. Or they're arguing that somehow they preserve you know, they'll also use full information. I have no idea what that means. They, they'll also, I mean, we'll also use like you know non-parametric uh, um, models to, to produce uh, data. And so this is what I was. There is okay. So there is not much work on what you're asking. And actually, the only uh, and as far as the general, what we call their general and specific utility measures for synthetic data. What we call specific utility measures, it's very task oriented, right? Um, do I, how do I, if I want to run the chi-square test of independence, how well do I do, you know, on the synthetic, non-synthetic data? If I'm, if I'm fitting regression models, I want my confidence interval on my, uh, uh, from my synthetic data to overlap, you know, significantly. Now you're going to ask me what's significant, right? Um, with regression, with, with confidence intervals on my regression estimates from my original data. Those are the type of statistics, specific tasks, statistics that people have been looking in evaluating the data, right? Now we started talking more about, but we also need more general measures of utility, okay, which rely on distributional comparisons. Right? And, and this question of what, what I was saying, well, we started looking at least this one measure of this propensity uh, MSC, um, or you know, people have look, used a Kolbeck Leibler uh, distance to figure out if, if the distributions are similar. So those are the type of things that they've been looking at. There, there is nothing more, nothing more elaborate to, 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 to but um, that said, the technology has been around for a long time. I am not aware, maybe Frauke knows, I am not aware on any paper that published their results and their analysis relying solely on synthetic data. So they are intended for exploratory purposes, and I think, I'm not sure that you can convince somebody for more than that, but I, I, I See, I mean, yeah. So I, mean, I no think. Substantive papers. I mean, methodology right. goes short, but not yes, no substantive papers, right? So I think the way we should be thinking about when, when you're saying, well, this is in contrast, right? I want these accuracies here, but I want this. I think this is what exactly what you have, what you need to lay out, and you say certain things are only for exploratory purposes, right? You're going to get some sense of accuracy. You know, if, I, if you're running synthetic data and some models, depending how synthetic data are generated, which is going back also to, to um, Rachel's point of, she said, well, for certain things, when she was doing certain analysis, things just didn't work, right? Synthetic data wasn't valid. So she had to continually figure out how to update or what to do, right? And so you're going to go in, you're going to try things, and then maybe you're going to figure out, OK, so these data are not going to work for me, or I can't do this type of analysis with this data, or I just have to wait a year until I get access to, to the original data. Unless we can provide better products that would somehow address this. And I don't have, this is, this is a very much open question, and it's been you know, open for a long time. And you, Adam, have asked this question in 2005, you've asked this question in 2010, right? But I the answer. <laughs> right? Well, no, because it's the it same sense. answer, same <laughs> answer for the past, you know, 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Jerry Ryder, you know, do a paper where he took out, uh, the Office of Personnel Management data yes. and made a synthetic data set, did the analysis, used the verification server to, to okay. check everything, and published it as a research result. But I don't. I think he publishes to demonstrate the synthetic data. He did not. He was not making any uh, substantive uh, conclusions from it, or, or things that will make uh, 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 impact policies. So we should check. My recollection was that it was an honest research uh, oh, result. Oh, great! Well. And using the OPM data was particularly a good choice since the Chinese have it anyway. <laughs> okay. No, we, we should definitely take a look. I, I mean, as I said, I, I, I said I wasn't aware, but it's possible that, that, that there is. We should take a look at that then. This is a good time to break. I should thank Sesha and Rachel and the other.